So we're just uh, giving the um, the end of the uh, preview of um, chapter 11 of the two chapters, 10 and 11, that we're studying today. Sorry, we got a little bit late recording here. So, so then we have the two witnesses in chapter 11 who were to prophesy that 42 weeks of trampling this, uh, sorry, I said that already. So we have the, I'll just repeat it for those that just came on. So um, the two witnesses who were to prophesy um, during the 42 weeks, um, there's difference of interpretation of who this is. Could be two principles, two groups of people, or two peoples, or Moses and uh, to Moses and Elijah. But the Jewish law requires two people to witness to prove a matter legally. So you have this sense of two powerful people, both in tandem, witnessing to God's truth with the full power and authority to speak his word and to bring it to pass. And in the same sense, we are all his witnesses, um, testified uh, to testify to the truth of God in a hostile world. And then we have the death of the two witnesses by the beast who came up out of the abyss. And then afterwards, their powerful resurrection, where they're taken up then into heaven. And then after this, we see for the first time that finally eyes seem to be opened. And after a severe earthquake, 7,000 were killed, but the survivors re responded now by glorifying God. So there's a recognition of something going on, that God is real, and they're glorifying him. And then begins the seventh judgment. So the focus verse uh, today is Revelation 11, 15, the seventh and the seventh, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven, which said, the kingdom of this world has become, has come, and the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. And the take home for today's lesson is, God entrusts his powerful word to believers to testify to the world before coming judgment. And the application, how? is ingesting the book of Revelation, renewing your desire to warn others of the coming judgment. Thank you. And we'll go back to Al. Thank you, Thank you Karen. That was great. I'm going to uh, share a screen now and uh, go right to the PowerPoint presentation. So, um, uh, I don't know why I'm... <laughs> A mighty angel, two witnesses in Christ's eternal reign. And Karen just gave us the take home. God entrusts his powerful word to believers to testify to the world before judgment and how it's ingesting the book of Revelation, renewing your desire to warn others of the coming judgment. And uh, the focus first. It's worth reading again one more time. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. In a sense, it is finished at that moment, and it's a, a powerful thought. Um, today, rather than reading the scripture in advance, I thought we would read it in the context of the exegesis. And of course, every word will still be read. Um, and so I'm going to just go right ahead to where we pick up on the exegesis, but we're going to do it entirely in the context of the presentation because, again, as usual, I have just a little bit too much stuff. Um, then I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. He was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hand. The Greek term used was alos, another one of the same kind, not heteros, a different angel. So we see another mighty angel of the same ones that we've already had. And I think that's important. This is, is another similar angel. Um, it is uh, very clear that it is another one of the same. It's interesting. In English, we don't have that advantage of knowing. So if I ask for a pencil, if I ask for another pencil, if I ask for an Elos, it's going to be another one, just like the one I just had. If I ask for a heteros, I'd like to change it out for a different one. So this is important so that we know that this is another, just another angel like the other one, only it's a big, strong one. All right. He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun. His legs were like fiery pillars. 
and he was holding a little scroll. So this is a parallel to Ezekiel. And also we're going to discover to the eating of the scroll. And I think it's really important. Um, and so just before we get into Ezekiel, the difference between um, Israeli and Greek thought. So we, we in the Western world have sort of the Greek concept of the prophetic. And that is that it is a prophecy with a fulfillment. In, in the Hebrew mind, it is... Uh, prophecy sets up a pattern. Prophecy is pattern. And so that is the difference. In the Western or the Gentile mind, you end up having um, prophecy to be uh, a statement that then is fulfilled. And in the Hebrew mind, it is a, a, a pattern that is recapitulated, where a pattern of events illuminates a thematic replay of the future. That's how the Hebrew mind thinks. And so when we look at uh, at Ezekiel, it's in that context. And so uh, the richness and understanding that accompanies the rediscovery of Midrashic hermeneutic is one of the most exciting aspects as we study the Old Testament. And I keep seeing these incredible nuggets in the Old Testament. Well, that's what we're doing now, right? Is discovering, wow, there's all these things that speak to the New Testament. So we're going to go to Ezekiel and we're going to discover that uh, there is something there for us to know for revelation. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort the scriptures might have hope. Romans 15, 4. All right. This is then the revelation uh, explanation. And it goes back to chapter 4, where we saw that uh, there on the throne was someone sitting who had the appearance of jasper and ruby and a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. And what I'm not going to get into today is as well that the same the same living beings that are up there with the face, you remember, of the lion, the man, the eagle, um, they, they're up there as well. But let's just compare here now to Ezekiel. Then there came a voice from above the vault over their heads as they stood with lowered wings. That's those uh, creatures. And above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. And I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal as a full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day. So was the radiance around him. So this concept of the emerald with the radiance of a rainbow is consistent and written so many thousands of years apart. And it's we know we're seeing truth. We've got, in essence, two witnesses at this moment. Again, when a righteous person turns from their righteousness and does evil, and I put a stumbling block before them, they will die. Since you did not warn them, they will die for their sin. The righteous things that a person did will not be remembered, and I'll hold you accountable for their blood. Now, I'm actually reminding myself here, I've got a red border on here, and that is because I hadn't intended to read it, but I will have it attached to the slides. And you can go back through the ones with the red border, and it should enhance our desire and our will to see people's salvation. And so um, we believe that we vicariously witness the horrific events described in Revelation to encourage us to be serious about reaching the lost. So read these words to Ezekiel. And like I said, I'm not going to read them now. But they've been in front of you and they will be in the slides. Now, this is the part then that I wanted to carry on reading. Um, he was holding a little scroll which lay open in his hands. So unlike the last scroll where the lamb loosed the seals, this scroll lays open in the angel's hand. And seven thunders announce its content. But alas, we are not and will not hear it until the day that is actually pronounced. So this raises an interesting question. Okay, so we weren't supposed to hear that. But I'll tell you what I know for sure we are supposed to hear. We're supposed to hear that we aren't able to hear it. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense to you. But it, we, we have thunders. And um, it's interesting in, uh, in the Psalms. It, um, I actually wanted to uh, tell you about that as well. Um, um, in, in Psalms uh, 29. And, and maybe jot that down with your pencil on the side there. Read Psalm 29 and you discover what the voice of God is like. It splits the cedars of Lebanon. It twists the oaks. It's, uh, it's an amazing and thunderous voice. But uh, we're not allowed to know what it is. John knew what it was, but he went to his death 
with it. He didn't tell anybody because he was told that it's not for, for now. Um, he planted his right foot on the scene, his left foot on the land, and he gave a loud shout like the roar of a lion. And when he shouted, the voices of the seven thunders spoke. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write, but I heard a voice from heaven say, seal up what seven thunders have said. Do not write it down. We can't hear it. That's amazing. So I don't know that we're supposed to speculate um, around what was said because God has made it clear that we're not to know. But um, he, he, he does want us to know that there's something coming that we don't yet know, which is a really interesting thought. It's to create suspense and anticipation, or is it? God commanded at least one other prophet to seal up Revelation. This is from Bible Study Fellowship again. Daniel was told, roll up and seal the words until the end of history. God is sovereign over his own purposes and their timing. Sometimes God and his intentions are incomprehensible to us, but God has revealed so much to us that we are to know and understand. We're to treasure what God reveals to us in the Bible, not speculate about what he chooses not to reveal. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. And so, for whatever reason, God and Christ want us to know that there's seven thunders and the words of them that will be re revealed at the end time. And I think that, again, is to just encourage us and, and, and make, make us so ready to share the gospel about the things that we do know and have heard. Then the angel had seen standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven. And he swore by him who lives forever, who created the heavens and all that is in them, the earth and all that is in it, and the sea and all that is in it. And he said, there will be no more delay. But in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumper, the mystery of God will be accomplished, just as he announced to his servants, the prophet. In a way, it's like when Christ was on the cross and he said, it is finished. Um, this is a similar statement. It says at this point, now in a whole nother new way, it is finished. Let's look briefly about swearing. That's an interesting thing because um, and the angel swears an oath. His rules are obviously different than for us because Jesus gave us rules around swearing an oath. You remember on the Sermon on the Mount when we were doing Matthew not so long ago, um, Jesus said this in chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount. Again, you have heard that it was said to people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, not by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. But what about God? God um, makes a promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater for him to swear by. He swore by himself. So God is allowed to swear. And obviously this angel is allowed to swear by God. I will surely bless you and give you many descendants. And so after waiting patiently, Abraham received what was promised. And this is it. This is it out of Genesis 22, where 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 the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time. And he says, I swear by myself, declares the Lord. So God himself is swearing by himself that because you've done this and not without your son, your only son, who he was about to sacrifice on Mount Moriah, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So God swears by himself, and here this angel swears by God as well in heaven. People swear by... Now, out of Hebrews, we also get some further instruction, which is great. People swear by someone greater than themselves. The oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument, because God wanted to make... The unchanging nature of his purpose very clear. The heirs of what was promised, he confirmed it with an oath. God did this so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Or Melchizedek is actually how it's pronounced. Very, very interesting. Now, in court of law, you're asked to swear on a Bible to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. So help you God. You, 
I, I, I do this quite often in my work because I am an expert witness. Um, however, our, 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 our rules of our government have made it that you no longer have to place your hand on a Bible. These variances are often allowed by statute. Karen just pointed out it's done on the ground for the Muslims. A witness or a solemn affirmation has the same legal consequences as a traditional swearing on a Bible. You would be held to the same statutes and rules that apply to sworn statement. So as an expert witness, um, I'm asked to swear on a Bible, and I've generally quoted Matthew 5, don't swear on anything. I say, do you know that that book tells you not to swear on anything? They say, yes, yes, yes. Okay, well, here, take the solemn affirmation oath. And I do that, and it's this, this, is, this is a good one. I, I'm thinking this is probably something I should say. You honor my commitment to the truth and to the Lord of the truth. Jesus Christ leads me to believe, be dishonor uh, both my commitment to the Lord and the Lord himself. If I needed to put my hand on the sacred book to guarantee my truthfulness, I'm totally committed to the truth and to the Lord of truth. And that actually, I've discovered, carries a whole lot more weight. So when you protest, because the Bible says that I'm not going to swear on it, they actually elevate your, your, your you know, they, they think more highly of you. Very, very fascinating. So when I'm an expert witness and I'm about to speak to a court case from the position of an architect, which happens regularly, then um, I will, you know, I've never said anything quite as profound as that, but um, I, I, I do mention that the book says that you shouldn't swear by it. And they say, oh, well, you obviously know it. And, and it's, it goes very well. Anyway, so much for swearing in. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. Go, take the scroll that lies open in the hand of the angel who's standing on the sea and on the land. So John up in heaven is supposed to go take the scroll. I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. And he said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. So I took the scroll from the angel's hand and I ate it and it tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I'd eaten it, my stomach turned sour. Oh my goodness. Then I was told you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Now, bear in mind, um, we're going to see Ezekiel, and there's a difference. Ezekiel prophesies to the children of Israel, but John is speaking to people of nations, languages, and kings, right? So here's the comparison. We just read the top part. Then I looked, I saw a hand stretched out to me, and it was a scroll which he unrolled before me. On both sides of it were written words of lament, mourning, and woe. So in many ways, it's a very, very similar scroll, right? Number one, it's small enough that you can eat it. I actually was going to pull up some archaeology because I just I just love that stuff, right? But, um, they have got, they have found some little copper, little metal scrolls, which you obviously could not eat. Um, I, I've, I've actually eaten Chinese rice paper before that you could have written on. Uh, but this one is edible, but uh, it's amazing how tiny they were. So a tiny little scroll that you can manage to eat. Um, and, and it was written on both sides. And uh, something tells me it's words of lament, mourning, and woe. Anyway, uh, let's let's uh, so so in Ezekiel he says, Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites to a rebellious nation that rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have been in revolt against me to this very day. So the difference is we now have many peoples, nations, uh, languages, and kings in revolt. But back in Ezekiel's day, it was to the children of Israel. But the very similar thing happens uh, because um, he he has a tasting as sweet as honey, and um, so I ate it and it was sweet as honey in my mouth. So Ezekiel's very, very similar thing eats it. It doesn't talk about it being sour, but it talks about it being difficult. And it is sweet as honey in his mouth. Very interesting. All right. We now have two witnesses. And uh, oh, I can't, I always get so excited about the architectural things. Forgive me, guys. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers. Guys, I never leave home without a measuring tape. Everywhere I go, I measure stairs, I measure things. I've got a, a measuring device, a laser pointer always on me so I can measure stuff. But here, uh, John is going and told to measure measure the temple of god so obviously there's a temple at this time but exclude the outer court and do not measure it because it's been given to the gentiles they will trample the holy city for 42 months all right does this mean that the temple gets rebuilt well if you take the bible literally it does mean that it's likely that the temple gets rebuilt and based on the evidence i've experienced it, it's going to get rebuilt when i was there um back in in 1987 or 8 um i attended at the betzalel school of architecture and they told me my professors told me absolutely al in no 
no, uh, you know, in unequivocal terms, the temple by zealous Jews has been prepared and it's there in precast form and it could go up very, very quickly. That's my professors at the Betzalel School of Architecture. There's a huge part uh, desire on the part of the Israelis to get the Holy of Holies on the exact location. And so there's a couple of options out there. And I'm going to go through those with you real quick. Um, and uh, of course, if you're going to rebuild the temple, the Holy of Holies has to go in its exact spot. And that's part of the problem, right? A little bit of background history. Um, the temple got destroyed. This is Herod's temple. We make the assumption it was particularly on the location of Solomon's temple. Um, in 70 AD, we had Vespasian, Titus, we've gone through this recently, you saw that history. They came and destroyed uh, when we did Matthew. Vespasian and Titus were in, in Israel. They were told, get Israel under wraps. And um, Vespasian's the dad to Titus and Domitian. And they go back to Rome and Vespasian becomes Caesar and Titus goes back to finish the job and Titus destroys Jerusalem entirely, leaves not one stone on top of the other, exactly as Christ has said. And Domitian, that son is the one that has got John on the island of Patmos. Very interesting. That's 70. 132 uh, AD, there's a Bar Kokhba revolt. And so the Jews are not happy with Roman occupation. And the only thing I could find for them were coins because they're not big on making coins about themselves. They they have the olive branch and God always represented, which is interesting. Three short years later, the Romans reign Jerusalem again, and they rename it to Aelia Capitolina, and it's it's based on Hadrian's uh, middle name. That's how the city gets named, and they build a temple to Jupiter over the site of the Jewish temple, and they put a, an equestrian statue of Hadrian right over the Holy of Holies. That's what history tells us. That's what the, the, the Romans came to do to make sure that, that and, and it is an abomination, right? Because now the, he's revering himself. There's a coin of him as well, by the way. Um, okay, so we end up with Hadrian, and uh, uh, he, by the way, uh, now we have Antonius Pius, who is... Uh, the husband of the niece of, of, of Hadrian, who adopts Antonius Pius, he's the guy that builds the temple to Jupiter, and um, it's that relationship that has him adopt him. So, so, so Antonius Pius, the guy on the right here, marries uh, the niece of Hadrian, and Hadrian, and, and so he wants to honor him with this city and names it after him and builds a temple to Jupiter. And this is how it looks. Now, it's always the same shape, this temple, Jupiter, and it's got an equestrian statue right in the middle in front of the temple. But um, this is how it lays out. And there is one in Bubic, Lebanon, where you can still make out the runes, and that's the exact same temple, and that's the runes of it. And so I went to Google Earth, and I could measure... Um, how big how big that actually is and it's uh, 340 feet between the two components and so then if you overlay that on the uh, site of the temple mount you discover that's the exact same dimension between the dome of the rock now the dome of the rock is not the mosque it's the dome I've been in there I mentioned that to you right and inside it says uh, God does not beget and is not begotten and then this is actually the mosque of Aqsa, that's the Al Aqsa Mosque down below here, and uh, so this is what was there uh, when the Romans rebuilt it. It's an axial line, and so if you take the Belbic plan and you superimpose it on the Temple Mount, this is what you get. It's going to just slowly emerge, and you can see you have this hexagonal structure exactly where uh, the, um, uh, the dome of the rock is, and on it is the rock where Right inside it is the rock where supposedly Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, but the Muslims turn it around and they say he was going to sacrifice Ishmael because they wrote their own story. Um, and it's also where um, Muhammad ascended to heaven on a white horse. That's why they revere it so highly. But then, the, of course, what happens then is uh, this gets built and, and the, the temple to Jupiter uh, eventually the the Muslims come and there's enough of a foundation there that they turn that into their mosque and and of course the other is the um, the Dome of the Rock and so and the question statue uh, is right in the middle there and that is according to history where 
the uh, actually holy of holies was. They want to make sure. Now, that's a theory uh, based on that history. That, by the way, is a statue of Hadrian that would have been put there, right? And there he is, Hadrian, uh, and that's uh, what would have been right there at the middle. What Antonius Pius does to honor his uh, the person, his father, his adoptive father. Uh, and uh, the the uncle of his bride. So this is the Temple Mount. Um, this is then the historic traditional view. So the Jews, the most of the Israeli population, believes that the Dome of the Rock, sitting over that big rock, is got the Holy of Holies right in the middle of it. That's what they believe. Then we have the Northern Conjecture, which is by Asher Kaufman, who came up with a big theory that the Temple actually sits there. And then we have... Uh, this research with the temple to Jupiter, which has the Holy of Holies, and there's a fountain right now where that is. Now, bear in mind, um, after this uh, this architecture was put up, we in in in, in 300 we have Theodosius, uh, the emperor, now makes all this Christian. So so the temple to Jupiter becomes a Christian church um, until the Muslims take over and turn it into the mosque and build the Dome of the Rock. The Dome of the Rock has built, been rebuilt several times because there's been earthquakes. But um, so we have three possibilities, the Northern Conjecture, traditional view, the Southern Conjecture, and one more, which has the Holy of Holies over the temp, over the, the spirit, the, um, the uh, uh, Dome of the Spirits, which is right beside the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is a whole nother story, which uh, I, we don't have time for this morning, but uh, very, very fascinating. And by the way, there is, a, through thermographic imaging, right in alignment with this view, there is an opening that we think may be the first Eastern great Gate, uh, and it's in alignment with, with the one that history claims and has the uh, Holy of Holies right on top of that fountain that's there right now. So if that were proven, then you literally, uh, you can see the only one that has to take out the mosque is where you believe the Holy of Holies is on the mosque. The other ones could be built right beside it, which is interesting. There's also a subterranean proposal. Why don't we just build it underneath? And the Muslims have excavated underneath. They're now sifting through all the stuff that they took and put into a junk heap, and they're finding incredible things there. But I don't think neither the Muslims or the Jews will like this solution, notwithstanding. Just opened, there is a synagogue under the Temple Mount. <laughs> this is what it looks like in all of the caves that are underneath, right? And all of the, the removal of all the earth and everything that they've taken out, uh, the Jews are sifting through and they've found incredible things. So there's always this, you know, people claim, well, the Jews were never on this Temple Mount. Well, here we have 2,000-year-old temple tax, silver coin, found in that debris that the Muslims removed. Uh, we have the royal seal of Hezekiah found by Elat Mazar in 2022. So, guys, the Jews, their story is true. They should have the Temple Mount. But, of course, it's all very politically embroiled. Oh, what a mess. Jeremiah uh, 25 explains, and I, I've got a very interesting story here for you, which um, I, I have to hurry, 1037, uh, 937. Um, on August 17th of that year, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign, ne Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, an official of the Babylonian king, arrived in Jerusalem. He burned down the temple of the Lord, the royal palace, all the house of Jerusalem. He destroyed all the important buildings of the city. Then he supervised the entire Babylonian army as they tore down the walls of Jerusalem on every side. So this is in Solomon's day, um, not in 70, where, where Titus did it. This is the first time um, many thousands of years ago, right? Solomon's temple was destroyed, but a very interesting thing. In the book of Maccabees, which is out of the Apocrypha, which is in the Septuagint, which is in the very first uh, King James Bible has the uh, Apocrypha in it. Um, and Jeremiah came and found a cave and he brought the tent and the Ark of the Covenant and the altar of incense and he sealed up the entrance. And some of those, so he goes into the cave of Zedekiah down below, and I'll show you how he got it there. Very, very interesting. And uh, somebody, one, one of the other uh, priests came and was going to mark the way, 
And when Jeremiah learned of it, he rebuked him and declared, The place shall be unknown until God gathers his people together again and shows his mercy. And then the Lord will disclose these things. The glory of the Lord in the cloud will appear, as they were shown in the case of Moses and Solomon, asked that the place be specifically consecrated. So when Solomon built the temple, he built a place for the Ark of the Covenant to be for a very long time. And it was in this cave because he had a premonition that this might be coming. And so in Zedekiah's cave, there's a very interesting thing. The red denotes the network in Zedekiah's cave. This is how it looks down there. And there is a plaque uh, about a monument that got removed and is in the British Museum. And the plaque explains the way, the direction to the ark, but it's unfinished as per, per Jeremiah's mandate. And the plaque, this is it, um, is in the labyrinth, and it tells you how to get to the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I believe it's been found by Ron Wyatt, um, and it's a very, very interesting story. But uh, well, it's way too long to say today, but this is what's on there, and it points the way to the Ark of the Covenant in that labyrinth. And in, in the Maccabees, we discover that it's there. So it's actually never, ever gone lost. And it, I believe it is entirely, perfectly under the site where Christ was crucified, uh, which is very interesting. And that through the earthquake, the blood dripped onto the uh, cracked sarcophagus in which the Ark of Covenant was onto the mercy seat. I know that's amazing. The Lord, so when Solomon dedicated the temple, says, the Lord has said that he would dwell in the thick cloud, in the darkness. I have built for you a lofty house, so a place, a, a, a sanctified and glorified place for you to be in the temple, and also a place for you to be for a very, very long time. And so Jeremiah and the faithful priests warned of the Lord in a vision, uh, do, do what, <laughs> what they're supposed to do. So Solomon had built two columns uh, Jachin and Boaz, every, <laughs> every Freemason's temple has two columns in it, and they don't know why. It's Jachin and Boaz. One means force, one means fulcrum. And uh, don't forget, while Solomon is building the temple, he's married to uh, an a daughter of Pharaoh of Egypt. And there was nobody better with sand hydraulics than the the egyptians and they go up front and they have no purpose structurally uh to hold anything up usually we have columns like that and they're performing a structural role these ones here were a hydraulic elevator and we get a record of of this huge massive capital and a hollow column filled with sand and um and the height changes it gets 41.25 inches shorter which gives an elevator um, under the Holy of Holies, which I believe is, is where the Dome of the Spirits is, and created an elevator for the Ark of the Covenant to go in, to go into Zedekiah's cave, to where we discovered in the British Museum, there's a way to get to it. Incredible. We got to carry on, or we're not going to get through today. I could have a three-hour or four-hour session just on that stuff. It is so exciting. And I will appoint my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Sackcloth is a sign of mourning and repentance. They are the two olive trees and the two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone tries to harm them, fire comes from their mouths and devours their enemies. This is how anyone who wants to harm them must die. This is a very interesting thing. Um, so they're two mm -hmm. olive trees and two lampstands. They are olive trees, and, and it would take me another hour to, to show you this, but the olive trees provide a flow of oil constant to the lampstands so they never have to be served and never go out because they have a pipe right to it. It's like having a barbecue tied to the propane gas line, and it just always can be on because it's tied to the olive tree. Very interesting. And then we have this 1,260 days or 42 months we just saw. It's always the same amount of time. Now, I want to take you quickly to uh, Luke chapter 9, because we have a very, very interesting thing about calling down the fire of God. And so in 9, uh, Luke 9, when Jesus called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons, to cure diseases, and he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. They're not take a bag or shirt. If people do not welcome you, leave their town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So that's a start of chapter 9. At the end of chapter 9, and you remember, um, it's very clear how they're supposed to teeter town. But, uh, but at the end of chapter 9, we discover that 
uh, we've got James and John, the Sons of Thunder. <laughs> they they have a question, and um, uh, they want to call down fire from heaven, just like Elijah did. As the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely sets out for Jerusalem, sends the messengers on ahead who went to a Samaritan village to get things ready for him, but the people there did not welcome him because he was heading to Jerusalem. Now, you remember... He was so excited two weeks ago when we read about him and the woman at the well. And she brings out all the townspeople and uh, they come and hear the prophet. And he stays with them for two more days. But they worship at Mount Gerizim. And Jesus says, there will come a day we'll neither worship in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim. But we will worship wherever we are in our hearts. But when the, so, so for whatever reason, because he's going to Jerusalem, they're not happy to have him in their town. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked him, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them, just as Elijah did? That, by the way, is in your footnotes, just as Elijah did. But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. I'm assuming it was still in Samaria. But very, very interesting. So it's a time of grace. That changes at this end time with these two uh, witnesses. And as Karen mentioned, you always have two witnesses. Jesus responds exactly as instructed the disciples at the beginning of the chapter. He just carries on to receptive town. He, in essence, wipes the dust from his feet. And I'm sure that's what he told his messengers that he'd sent over there to get it ready for him. Now, in, in 2 Corinthians 5, uh, this is an epiphany that I had this morning. It's our ministry of reconciliation since, and to me, this might be the very most important part for today. Since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others what we are is plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. Um, we are not to trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, Christ's love compels us, Christ's love compels us. Our love for Christ should compel us to confer, to share the gospel, because we're convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and who was raised again. Remember how excited Christ was with the fields white unto harvest in that Samaritan village when we looked at it, Sikar, two weeks ago with the Samaritan woman. That's how we should be. Behold, so much so that we don't even have time to eat because he says, my food is to do the will of my father. And he's all excited to share the gospel with them. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... That person is a new creation. So what I did there, I made the um, the new creation has come dim because obviously somebody didn't pick up on what I think is a better translation. That person is a new creation. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are there for Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is our calling. We are given a ministry of reconciliation. We're to bring the world, word, the world to the word, to God, to Christ. Wow, that's our calling. Now, about that time period, 1,260 days is 42 months of 30 days each. Three and a half years. Three and a half years is the time. Jewish law required two witnesses. Karen already mentioned this to prove any matter legally. The two have God's power to stand for truth, yet they wear sackcloth, the clothing of mourning, their deep personal repentance and sorrow over all an, uh, an unrepentant world gives their words added strength. They have the power to shut up the heavens so that it will not rain during the time. We're back on Revelation 11, um, that they are prophesying. And they have the power to hurt, turn waters into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they want. So these are unique powers. They are the same as Elijah. Now, remember, Elijah was taken up at heaven. Um, he was there for the Mount of Transfiguration. He called down fire from heaven, and he also shut up heaven for three and a half years so it wouldn't rain. Very interesting, very interesting. Three and a half years, again, to the Mish Mishratic mind, 
its pattern. And so we see this pattern. I believe that when the Jews come to their senses and recognize Jesus, it'll just overwhelm them. Oh, my goodness. Over and over again. Now, Moses turned water into blood with the plagues, right? And I've given the references there, but we're not going to go to them right now because we don't have enough time. But we see this very interesting pattern in Elijah and Moses, right? And so a lot of theologians believe that they actually are Elijah and Moses. Very interesting. Don't forget, Elijah and Moses were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, with James and John up there, interestingly, right? Anyway, carrying on in chapter 11, verse 7, making sure that we read every word of Revelation. Now, when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes from the abyss will attack them and overpower them and will kill them. Their bodies will lie in the public square of the great city, which is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Sodom, because of the, the sexual sin. Um, and the uh, that's just such an abomination. And Egypt, uh, because of the magic arts and the idolatry. Just to make sure that we don't miss which city it is, it's where their Lord was crucified. It's Jerusalem. That's where this is going on. And interesting, three and a half days, people from every tribe, language, and nation will gaze on the bodies and refuse them burial. So, I believe there will be a ton of people from all of these tribes, languages, and nations in Jerusalem, but more so even is that the whole world can watch, right? They're going to pull up their iPhone and, and their TV and their computer and the internet, and it's all going to be on there, and they're all going to watch. The inhabitants of the earth will gloat over them and will celebrate by sending each other's gifts because these two prophets had tormented those who live on the earth with those plagues, right? So we know based on... Uh, the story of James and John, that Christ does not want us to call down fire on heaven. We're not going to get those powers. We are to shake off this dust from our shoes and carry on with the next ones that will listen and delight when the fields are white unto harvest. Ours is one of grace. This is a different ministry, and it's not in the church age. It follows it, So, but very, very fascinating. And don't forget, it's those that want to kill them that end up dying from the fire from their mouths. Very interesting. But after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered those two witnesses and they stood on their feet and terror struck those who saw them. Then I heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, come on up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked on. <laughs> they get raptured in full view of the whole world. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And at that very hour, there's a severe earthquake and one-tenth of Jerusalem collapsed, and one-tenth of the city collapsed. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake, and the survivors were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe has passed. The third woe is coming soon. So very, very interesting. Uh, 7,000 people are not a lot of people. Remember, last week, uh, we had a billion people die. Uh, in fact, uh, a billion and a half with the last plague. So 7,000 is a very small number, uh, but the earthquake uh, destroys one-tenth of Jerusalem. So a tenth of the city and the balance come to faith. They give glory to the God of heaven. It reminds me that when Elijah called down fire from heaven, the prophets of Baal were killed, but those uh, children of Israel turned to God, right? They chose God over Baal. Very interesting. This is the population of Jerusalem, 2023. It's 1,143,000. So if 7,000 die, but the balance turned to Christ, that's a huge number. Let's assume that a good chunk of Jerusalem turned to Christ and probably is why the armies of the world come against Jerusalem because now they have shown allegiance to Christ and ultimately Christ has to come and fight their battle for them, doesn't they? Now we're on chapter or verse 15. The seventh angel sounded its trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign for an ever and ever. Now note, the kingdom of the world has not been his till now. The prince of, of, of darkness, Satan, has been <coughs> in charge of the kingdom of the world. At this moment, Christ now takes it over. He, he comes with the deed. He says, I paid the price. This is mine. And now the kingdom of the world becomes his at this moment, at this what is now still in a prophetic future date. And 24 elders who were seated on the thrones before, before God fell on their faces, worshiped God, saying. And let's take a look at these 24 elders. I've had a thought. 
because there's an interesting dialogue in Matthew 19. Jesus says, um, because, you know, the rich young ruler says, uh, what can I do? And Jesus says, go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor and follow me. And then the disciples say, what about us? We dropped everything for you. And Jesus said unto them, verily I say unto you, that uh, ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, there's 24 thrones up there. I think half of them are taken by the disciples because that's what Jesus says here, I think. But it's up to you to find out, right? That's the whole idea of this. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or fathers or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life. Very interesting. The 12 uh, of the thrones be occupied by the 12 disciples. Finally, um, the seventh trumpet. We give thanks. So this is what they shout. Uh, just to get that continuity real quick. 24 elders, which represents the raptured church and the martyrs, everybody that's up there falls on their face and worships God. And this is what they say. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was because you've taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry and your wrath has come. Time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets, and your people who revere your name, both great and small, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened. Oh, by the way, there's a very interesting line here. Those who destroy the earth. So there's two ways that they destroy the earth. Who are they? Um, and by the way, you can check out the Greek word there. That will be in the slides. And uh, it is utterly spoil or corrupt. So there's two aspects and two facets, right? There's the spiritual and the physical side of the world. But I believe that the earth dwellers physically destroy the earth through their greed for gain. And of course, they are also causing the judgments of God to come upon the whole earth due to their lack of repentance and their continued idolatry and sin. So it always points back to decisions and things that they did that caused the difficulties. The fact that... Uh, the one third of the ocean turns to blood. Oh my goodness. Jesus has got a great big cleanup act, but don't forget he created in the first place. So it's, it's not hard for him to do. He can speak the words and make it all back to a paradise of God. It's going to be incredible. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and within his temple seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and earthquake and a severe hailstorm. So um, very interesting. We see the Ark of his Covenant. Now, don't forget, up in heaven, there is the Ark of his Covenant. It's There's always two copies. We're signing deals with people all the time. They get a copy. We get a copy. There's a heavenly Ark, and there is an earthly Ark, which is the Ark of the Covenant, which is the demonstration of it. Um, they both need original signatures on them, right? Um, and so up in heaven, there is heavenly version of it. But what did the earthly one look like? So I want to explain that a little bit through Hebrews 8. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it's not part of this creation. So um, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices. But the heavenly things themselves uh, with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the true one. He entered the heaven himself. Now to appear for us in God's presence. So God made the heavenly implements of the temple. We're even given the names of those that made the human ones. So the one in heaven is made by God. The one on earth is made by people. And Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah. And Oliab, the son of Ashamach, the tribe of Dan. Interesting, helps him. And all of the skilled workers that helped. The, um, the Holy Spirit fills them, which is, by the way, why the school in Israel is called the Bezalel School of Architecture, where I attended, right? And they make the Ark of the Covenant and the cover on it and the altar of incense. And last week we looked at the altar of incense. So let's take a look at the Ark of the Covenant today. And there's an interesting little diagram there. This is how I believe it looked, and I'll explain why, because Ron Wyatt actually found it. Uh, under where Christ was crucified, and I'm very convinced of it. It's there, of course, in the Holy of Holies, behind the curtain, 
this is the traditional understanding of the geometry. It's not correct because it's not even as the Bible describes it. And this is how we now understand it to be based on an eyewitness record. So um, the Ark of the Covenant has got two cherubs, one on each side, and poles that are there so you never have to touch it. And of course, um, and enthroned between the cherubim, the Ark that is called by the name. So it has to be a throne. It has to be a seat. And his, the historic view, because uh, he's enthroned, how do you sit on that? You can't sit on that. But this is the, the angel wings become a back to lean on, and it's a seat to sit on. It's a mercy seat. It's not That one's not a throne or seat. This one is a seat. I think this is absolutely right. How amazing. And how um, in Chronicles it describes that God is enthroned and seated between them. He has to be able to sit there. That's how it is. Now, remember, um, Uzzah tries to steady the ark and he dies because it's that holy they were supposed to grab it by the golden staves and carry it they were doing it wrong and david eventually but she just left because she brings it back so um, the ark of the covenant in exodus 25 you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold two and a half cubits long one and a half cubits wide you shall make two cherubim of hammered gold on the two ends of the seat making it one piece with the seat and have their wings spread upward, their, their right wing, as it turns out, and their wings and facing each other and look down at the mercy seat. That's exactly how that image is. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and there I will meet with you and speak with you from the mercy seat. Very interesting. Um, and I checked out uh, the uh, Septuagint because I want to make sure it was exactly the same. And of course, I had to. Uh, and by the way, there it is, the propitiatory. So um, propitiation is that God, consistent with his character, uh, looks at uh, looking after he appeases God for our sins by the blood of Christ. And so very, very interesting. Find this online later and read it about the propitiation of our sins. And that is the last thing that is revealed in this, in, in, in this part of the Bible and in revelation and it talks about the wood i found out that it is acacia wood or shittim wood exactly as it's described it's the hardest wood it comes from a tree that looks like this is still harvested but how wonderful then god's temple in heaven was opened and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant the heavenly version there came flashes of lightning rumblings peals of thunder and an earthquake and a severe hailstorm wow we don't have time to read this. I've got it in a red margin just so that you can go back to it and look at it. And then I'd like to just close with the focus verse. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said the kingdom of the world has come. The kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah will reign forever and ever. Take home. God entrusts his powerful word to believers to testify to the world before judgment. And how is ingesting the book of Revelation renewing your desire to warn others? of the coming judgment. So the judgment is so severe. Use it to get you to desire even more greatly to talk to your friends, your neighbors, your relatives, your children, whoever it is that needs to come uh, while we're still in this period of grace. Lord Jesus, we just thank you that you're sovereign. We thank you that you hold all things in your hands. We thank you for this incredibly powerful word that we're able to look at today in Revelation. Lord, let us be inspired to preach salvation, the truth of your word to everyone that we meet. Lord, let us look constantly for that opportunity. Let it be our food, just even as it was for Jesus, as he saw the Samaritan, Samaritans coming out of that city of Sychar and how he then had two days to witness and testify to them. Lord, we believe that so many of them uh, came to you in a powerful way as a result of that incredible two days. So Lord, help us find those minutes, those hours, those days to share our faith. Let it be our food. Help us to ingest your word so that we can then in turn bring it to those around us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you, you wonderful people.